as we conclude this evening in summarizing this evening I recognize that some of you may be here for the first time uh, and that this would uh, a summary of what we have presented in the last several days is a presentation of many many new things all things that have been turned in a new light and genuinely new revelation and insight so um, the summary will make sense only in respect to your having become familiar with the preceding messages however my hope is that uh, you will go back and listen to the messages and then within that context uh, the summary I believe will be a blessing to you. We began by saying that in Genesis 1.1 when the scriptures say in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth that the heavens and the earth did not previously exist that they were created the thing that is created is without prior existence and therefore the heavens and the earth are not eternal they had a beginning point and they had an end point and indeed in as much as they were created they had to have a creator who pre-existed their creation. So God, the creator, God who is in fact himself the beginning, created the heavens and the earth. But in order to understand why would God create the heavens and the earth, we had to recognize that there must have been a back story. There must have been a prior story that would justify the creation of the heavens and the earth and also that with this prior story the justification for the or the explanation for the creation of the heavens and the earth lies in the backstory so much so that heaven as it's created and earth as it is created were created to entertain to to put on display, to further the purposes of God that existed prior to the creation. So, uh, in answer to the question, why? Why did God create the heavens and the earth? The answer is because in the mind of God, there were purposes to be revealed. And to that end, God created the heavens and the earth. Which means that the heavens and the earth serve the purposes of God in a direct way. They do not just exist to adorn notions of who God is. They are directly connected to the revealing of the purposes of God. They are the vehicles, if you like, they are locations in which, the locus in quo, the locations in which God deposited things to be revealed in the revealing of which the purposes of God would be enabled and would be accurately hosted and presented. Now I understand that in saying all of that, that requires us to think in a very new way about the existence of the heavens and the earth. And in that sense, this was genuinely new revelation Although the substance of what has been revealed should not have been new to us. But when you understand that God created the heavens and the earth with the intent of hosting that which existed before, then your understanding of the heavens and the earth must be consistent with that hosting. So we, we asked and we answered the question, what existed before? And to, in, in uh, very brief, to bring you up, back up to that, I will remind you of what 
<clears throat> what was said in the book of Ephesians, uh, chapter 1. In Ephesians 1, <coughs> pardon me, <clears throat> at verse 3, Paul speaks in the effusive praise of God when he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, just as he chose us in him before the foundations foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved, accepted in Christ. In him we have redemption through, the blood, through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom, prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the gospel, the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption purchased of, of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. And so he says, verse 17, that uh, um, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that they may know what is the hope of his calling, which are the riches of his grace, of the, his inheritance in the saints, and that in the extent what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. That was the backstory. That was the explanation for the creation of the heavens and the earth. In the fullness of time, God would install the Son. In, on the throne of God. And there would be, as it were, a, a scroll that would be written upon. This scroll is the book of the, of the pre-creation activities, which when Christ came into creation, he would have to fulfill. So, according to uh, Hebrews chapter 10, he comes into the world to do just that. And so we pick that up. I'm attempting to summarize by, the, by reminding you of the scriptures we use.
eternal. But in those sacrifices, there's a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible, verse 4, that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. I come to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them. He had said that before which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So what God installed in heaven was that which would eventually come out of heaven, come into the earth, and be found in the earth to accomplish the will of God for which he established creation. As we looked into heaven, we began to see that there, were, uh, there was a greater realm, which is heaven, and a lesser realm, which was the earth. The earth was therefore an allegory of the heavens. God put in the earth things that would dispose our understanding to heaven. So that when the things of heaven come into the earth, they will be not entirely foreign and strange and difficult and possible to understand. So the nexus, the connection between heaven and earth, was designed to permit a flow between heaven and earth. Things flowing from heaven into earth. The question was, into what in the earth would these things flow? When God established the heavens and the earth, the scriptures say the earth was without form and void. And darkness was on the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. The earth was without form. It means it was like a wasteland. And void means that it had no obvious purpose to it. But then God began to shape the earth into the forms that would accommodate this allegory to the heavens. But the last piece of the earth that God shaped, that God formed, was the body of man. Man was formed by God from the dust of the ground. And God formed this body to contain a spirit. And God gave a spirit, which is an endowment of being, out of the very person of God to come to reside in this formed earth. When God did that, man had life, had being upon the earth. So that all that, so that God put in man, not only, <clears throat> not only the capacity to understand uh, the things that are in the mind of God, but God actually put in man something that was not even in heaven. Something that was greater than heaven. God put in man something that is outside of anything that is created. And that is a spirit. God put in man a spirit that came out of the person of God. This comes to vest in the earth. In this earth that he formed, the last bit of earth he formed, he formed to contain this thing. 
In doing so, God established the principle that man is greater than the creation itself. God established the principle that man is greater than heaven, man is greater than earth. Because what is in man came out of God and God existed before the creation of heaven and earth. There's a capacity in man, because of this endowment from God, there's a capacity in man to contain, therefore, the wisdom of the heavens and the wisdom of the earth. Right? Without being shrunken down to either one. You see, God exists apart from heaven and God exists apart from earth. Heaven and earth were created by him, which means he existed before they were created. And he continues to exist outside of the realms of heaven and earth. But what he put in heaven, what he put in earth, are manifestations of his being that are useful to explain him, to support what he's doing, and to establish the truths of who he is he is invisible by nature. Heaven and earth contain things that were designed to show who he is visibly. The presumption is that he himself would never be visible. But what is about him that can be shown would be visible. See? The thing about God that makes God visible that he created in this unique fashion of forming the earth and endowing with the spirit out of his person that thing which transcends creation which is greater than creation which is more exalted than creation and more valuable than to which not only the present age is subject, but also to which the age to come is subject, is man. That man God calls son. Son. It's not to angels, Hebrews tells us, that God has subjected the age to come. But somewhere it is written, a rhetorical question, what is man? that you are mindful of him, or the son of man, that you should visit him. You made him a little lower than the angels, in that you put him in a domain lower than the heavens. But yet you crowned him with glory and honor. And the proof that he has subjected the age to come, not to angels, but to man, is that we see Jesus, who was once with us and therefore once made a little lower than the angels. He's not here now as Jesus. He is seated in the heavenly realms. So we now see Jesus, who was like we are, a little lower than the angels. Now he is crowned with glory and honor. And that is the guarantee that we, who now are in the venue that is described as being a little bit lower than the angels, will also be crowned with glory and honor. And therefore, the statement that he has subjected the age to come to man, the proof of that is in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, who once was a little lower than the angels, now is crowned with glory and honor. And that statement, that reality, is the offered proof that we too, who are now a little lower than the angels, being in Christ, seated in heavenly realms, are destined to rule the age to come. So the purposes of God did not begin 
with heaven and earth and will not end with heaven and earth. They'll continue. There's an age to come. The beginning of which age will see the end of the present age. The present age, the present age that is defined by the existing heavens and earth will pass away. And with them will pass away the heavens and the earth as they now are. Hmm? Now, I understand these are, these are for the orphan culture. It's as though to just to peer into these things seems so uh, threatening. Like this is not, we should not be here. <laughs> it, it's a, uh, it's like in the Dr. Seuss book called The Cat in the Hat. When thing one and thing two came in, the children said, they should not be here when our mother is not. <laughs> no, it seems like we are peering into things that are forbidden. And yet only the culture of an orphan has blinded our understanding to that which God has freely given you were destined in Christ before the creation of the earth to be conformed to the standard of Christ to the praise of his glorious grace. Why are we meant to be conformed to the standard of Christ? Because Christ is the reference to God as the Son. There's God the Father, and God the Son. Christ is the reference to the appearing of God as the Son. As the Son. In the Son, as modeled by Jesus, the fullness of the Godhead was put on display for all to see. In the Son. Now, Jesus, had, Jesus said, I'm going away. And when I go, I will send you the Comforter, who is the Holy Spirit. And he will take of what belongs to me, and he will disclose that to you. And he'll bring glory to me in the process. Furthermore, as we looked this morning, Jesus said to us in John 14, in my father's family. It's the same word of, as in my father's house. In the oikos of my father. In my father's family, there are many dwelling places. It means that before you were in your mother's womb, God knew who you were. He made you. He gave you an endowment of spirit out of his person to cause you in the fullness of time to be appropriately assembled into the Son. Jesus said these things that he was going away and that they would not see him in a little while and that in his father's house there are many rooms. Our assumptions have been on this verse, on the, this passage, John 14, our assumption has been based upon the theological perspective that we were, this was a statement about Jesus leaving the world and, and ascending to heaven. And that in heaven, he would establish rooms in these mansions over in glory land. And in the sweet by and by, when we'd passed on from here, we'd have a mansion just over in glory land. That probably would be a mansion with a 99-year lease. <laughs> if heaven is going to be dissolved, you see? So you don't want that mansion. You don't want a dwelling place like that because ultimately when the heavens that contain it are dissolved, so there goes your mansion. Then what? 
Then what? We, we, we want to sort of put it out of mind. But what he gave us is a more permanent dwelling place. And in fact, he assembled us into the corpus of Christ, into the Father's house. Christ is the dwelling place of the Father's Son. Christ is the dwelling place of the Father's sons. Many sons in the one Son. Wherever you have the dwelling place of the sons, that's the Father's house. Think about it. In the norm, in the normal, no, no great imagination is required. Where do your children live? Where do you call home for the children? It's your house is your house. The dwelling place of the father's children is called the house of God. And the exclusive dwelling place of all of the father's children is known as Christ. Christ is the corporate house of God. His is the spirit that was sent to assemble our spirits to himself so that in him we might be presented to the Father as the corporate son. And no man, I have it on good authority, no one may call God Father except in Son. No one may therefore come to the Father except in Son. And I've said now, this will be the third time, that there is no understanding of God except the God who is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why no one can come to the Father except through Jesus the Christ. Except in the spiritual man the body of Christ is not a natural body, it's a spiritual body. And we cannot come to the Father of our spirits except in the corporate man who is himself spirit. Do we believe that God is a spirit? Of course, we do. Spirit begets spirit. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Why then should it be so difficult for us to understand that coming to the Father we do so as spirits? He's not the father of our flesh and our flesh houses our spirit. So even though we have a spirit in this flesh, this flesh does not, does not decide every aspect of our spirit, only its location in the moment in time. These same spirits that are in us are assembled to this spirit man known as Christ. How is that assembly taken? Take, how does that take place? It takes place by the act of baptism. Let me show you from uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's an assembling. It's an assembling in the earth of this spiritual man, this corporate man. <clears throat> Pardon me. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we'll go to verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members. Now what is he talking about? He's talking about the human body. He's using an analogy. The familiar to the unfamiliar. Now this is why I say the earth is an analogy of the heavens. The visible is used to explain the invisible. Because we do not naturally understand the invisible. 
because our spirits have been alienated from God since the fall. So bringing us back into union and fellowship with God, God set the earth up so that he could use it to explain to us again that which we originally knew but lost the knowledge of. So here it says, For as the body is one and has many members, that is, as the human body, you just have one body. As a human being, you have one body. If you have two, it's somebody else's. One is somebody else's. <laughs> for, for as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that body are one, being many, being many are one body, so also is Christ. So what's the point of the natural analogy to the body? To tell us about the body of Christ. So there again, it says, uh, the many members, one body. One body, many members, just in case you're, you're dyslexic. <laughs> yeah, you, get, you get it better the other way. So the body of Christ, then, like the human body, is comprised of many members. If that body is spirit, if that body is a spiritual body, then how do we understand the members of it? The human body is material. It's a natural body. So what is our understanding of the members of any human body, your own, mine, whomever? That all the parts are physical. They can be touched, they can be seen, they can be apprehended in the sense by the five senses. Right? And they are, they form one body, they move as one, and you can see all the parts, or at least you can see the external parts, and you may infer the internal parts. But when you even see those, they're natural. They're, they're, they're concrete, as it were. If that's the analogy to a spiritual body, which is an invisible body, because spirit is invisible, but invisibility does not mean non-existent. It means you just can't see it. But does it exist? Well, your body exists until the spirit in it leaves it. And it's said to be dead. The mere fact that you're alive and can listen to what I'm saying, you're sitting here, you're breathing, means that there is an invisible part of you that is responsible for all of the sentient functions within your being. So, so, I mean, to say that the invisible is not real is patently uh, foolish. It's foolish on its face because you are the prime example of the invisible component of you causing the functioning of the visible components of yourself. All right? So it is with Christ. The members of this body then are invisible. So no part of your physical body is part of the body of Christ. Okay? Your physical body is a tool to be used, but no part of your, of your physical body is, a, is spirit, therefore it cannot be assembled to the body of Christ. Now the importance of that is that we understand that in Christ we are one race. We're one race. We are a spiritual race. The interesting thing about a spirit it is that is that it's not black, no it's not, no is it white? It's not tall, it's not short. 
It's not old. It's not young. It's not a child. It's not an adult. A spiritual being is a being from outside of time and the created world that lives in time and in the created world in a form that's drawn from the creation, but the thing that is in it, the spirit that is in your, in your body, your spirit, is greater than the created world. So we are the most ancient race. We are the most ancient race. Shall I say we're a timeless race? We're an ageless race. We are a perpetual race. So why on earth would we want to argue over and be divided by everything that is perishable? Why would that make any sense at all to us? Someone who says, I can't sit in the same audience with those people and yet say we are believers in Christ. I wouldn't say they're not, but I would say the level of their understanding is pre napios And Napios is the earliest stage. I think you call that stage, duh. <laughs> so the next time you hear someone say, I can't sit in the room with those people, and yet I'm a believer, have mercy on duh. Why would you ever get angry at a person like that? I mean, do you get angry at a child for behaving like a child? No. It's, it's what people say help you locate who they are, where they are. You have a mandate that the extent to which Christ has been formed in you live up to the measure of what you've already attained. Now, what happens if they kill your body? What, what happens if, you, if you're killed for the purposes, for, for the, uh, the holding forth of what is true? All that they manage to do is deny you a house to occupy any longer in this world. That's the only thing that has happened. And you rejoin the ages as part of the ageless, timeless reality of God. How long do you think God hid in himself, according to Ephesians, where it says, for God, Ephesians 3.20, for God hid in himself for long ages past this plan to be revealed in Son. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to principalities and powers in the heavenly realms, which he purposed to put in, into Fulfillment when the times had reached their fullness. How long were you in the mind of the Lord? How long did God understand the nature of the specific being or endowment of spirit that he gave you, that gave you being? The reason I take you in this direction for a moment is for perspective, for perspective. Yes, you might be highly disun unfavored by men. Some people are highly favored of men. But some are equally highly unfavored of men. 
but how does that change the intention of God for you? And how does that alter the value of your being? If you so vastly transcend the entire creation, the worst absolutely that can be done to you is for you to be tormented in the course of your life and then for your life to be taken from you. That's absolutely the worst that could happen to you. But because you're an ageless spirit, none of that attenuates to you as a spirit. It only attenuates to your body. Your body is not who you are. Your body is where you are. Who you are came as an endowment of being out of the person of God and in value is more valuable than the heavens and the earth combined. And you read that. You read that. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What is more valuable? What in creation could exceed your value if God established all of creation to house his intentions to assemble you into the corporate Christ? So one body, many members. We'll continue just a bit with the reading from um, 1 Corinthians. How do we get into this body of Christ. How precisely does the spirit that we are become assembled into that spiritual entity uh, that is many-membered like the human body is many-membered? How does that occur? How is that transition uh, accomplished? Verse 13 says, For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Greeks, whether we be slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. So how are you assembled? How are the parts of the body of Christ assembled? They exist in us, these parts, each one of us is a spirit. When, when we're born again, we now are able to call God Father. But how do we actually, uh, how are we collated? How are we assembled? How are we put together into the spiritual man? The answer you just read, we're baptized into. We're baptized into the spiritual man. Baptism there is a passing through into. So we pass from a natural existence into a spiritual existence. In other words, the spirit that is in us was not functional. Our souls were dominant. But when we made a decision, when we took a decision to obey the Lord, to begin the process of being reconciled to him by the act of, being, of deciding to be obedient, to come under the rule of Christ, then God began a process that started with giving us the Holy Spirit. This morning we recognized uh, in, the, in the passage we looked at from John 14 that by giving us the Holy Spirit, he plugged us in, the dunamos of the Spirit, the Spirit having power, plugged, plugged in, and, and, and who we are came alive. It animated our minds. It animated the entirety of our spiritual beings, of our spirits, which until then languished, uh, contributing no value to our existence. So we were dead while we were alive. We're alive in the flesh, but in our spirit, we were 
we were not animated. We were not animated. That part of us that was made to, to function gloriously had been shut down, uncoupled from power. When the Holy Spirit plugged us back in, suddenly we had a consciousness toward God. And the first indication of this consciousness toward God is that we recognized that He is our Father. Now, that was a starting point. Recognizing that we have God as our Father means we now have the knowledge of sonship. We have the beginnings of the knowledge of sonship. If you say, Father, Father, what would that suggest to you? What kind of mindset would that suggest to you? That you have an awareness of parentage, that you belong to somebody, that you are a son to somebody. So, the Holy Spirit, when He comes, brings the Spirit of the Son into our hearts. And in that instant, when we cry out, Father, Father, evincing the existence of the Spirit of the Son within us that's now alive, the next thing that God does is He takes us and places us into what is already Son in the earth. That which is already Son in the earth is the existent body of Christ. So it's like in the, the part has been made alive, recognizes that it's, it's, it has the relationship to God as a son does to a father. So God puts him in the environment in which he was designed to be placed. Instantly. The first work of the Holy Spirit to you, once he reanimates your understanding, the mind of your spirit, the next thing he must do is put you into, put you into the framework that this animation was designed to function in. You see? You can't function alone. He didn't animate a part to look at it as a part and say, what a wonderful part. Oh. There was a native home, a native environment, a location in God into which this part was designed to fit. Before you were in your mother's womb, God designed a place for you in this corporate man, in this spiritual man. Now you don't know what that place is, you don't know what it looks like, you've just been born. Lots of things you don't know when you're born. Lots of needs you have when you're just born. You're totally dependent. So you need something called a parakletos, a helper who knows the way, who understands everything about you that you have not even begun to discover yet. So God doesn't cause you to come alive and leave you in the field. Leave you in the womb, as it were. Leave you in the water. Leave you abandoned. In fact, he said, I did not intend to leave you as orphans. So, God, knowing what you need, does not ask your permission. Because now he is your father, and he's begun to assume responsibilities for you, that you are not even aware of in terms of what you need or how those needs might be met. God entrusted the task of placing you into your spot as a member of something greater than you, you now are. The greater thing pre-existed you. You just discovered it when you were born again. It has always existed or it has existed since it was brought forth upon the earth out of death. 
when the man Christ Jesus was raised from the dead. And it has been here in the earth since then. And all that led up to, uh, the, in the history of the world, led up to that was merely preparatory for that to happen. So the Spirit takes you who have just been born again and he transports you and assembles you into the very spot in Christ that you were designed by God before the ages began to fit. And not only did he design you for a relational fit in the body of Christ, but he also designed you and empowered you for a relational functioning in the place where you fit. So he not only gave you being of his being, that he's now animated again and fits you, but he gives you things that are called gifts and calling. The environment in which you are to function and the empowerment by which you will function. Needless to say, in this new installation, the knowledge of God is now being um, uh, created in you or imparted to you. You're being up, downloaded. Yeah, that's, that's the word. You're being in the body of Christ the Holy Spirit now begins to download all of the memory files that had been um, not deleted, but certainly lost. And in the process, you become aware more and more of this world you never knew existed. And there's a renewing taking place in your mind. What you did not understand before, didn't even know existed. Now all of a sudden, you have thoughts that are not thoughts that are familiar to you. And you're observing the behavior of others assembled into the same corpus as you. And you're seeing it with a whole different experience. And at first it's just weird <laughs> because you don't think like that. It's not anything that you have precedent with. And so people around you who are not necessarily assembled to Christ are looking at you and thinking something is different about you. Something is strange about you. You are peculiar. You're not the person that I used to run with. And some of them begin to say, Ish. <laughs> and they start talking about you. Because you're different. When you start showing up with them, they start making excuses as to why they have to suddenly go. And you're feeling weird that they think that you're so different because yes, you know that things are different about you, but you have, instead of having a lesser affection for them, you're actually trying and you've been trying to explain to them why suddenly things are new about you. And you're so excited about what's new about you that you're sure they're going to be as excited about it and about you as you are. And you can't understand when they don't want to talk to you about it. It's like an alien has come into you and everybody's looking at you like you're an alien. You don't belong here. You're not the same person. You know, where is my friend? <laughs> Where's my friend Paul? Where's my friend Susie? Uh, 
who took over? Has she lost her mind? And, and yes, the answer is yes, I have lost my mind. But I found a new mind. In fact, that's what I've been trying to chase you down to tell you about. <laughs> and that's the thing you don't want to hear about. You begin a process that is so tangibly different. And the clearest evidence that it is this different is that the people who used to love you for being what you were when you were like them now can't stand to be around you. If you want proof that something has happened when you are assembled into this spirit being, I'm just explaining to you what happens from the scriptures, but the effects are what you live every day. And after a while, you don't find that their ideas of life are the same as yours. And you don't find that where you want to go with life is where they're going. And, but just yesterday it seemed that everybody was going in the same direction. And they were happy to have each other's company going in that direction. So things begin to be new because there's a renewing of your mind to understand this change that has come about. Now, one of the things that seem to, uh, to be less urgent than it used to be was, who am I? Question, who am I? And why am I here? Because you find you're talking to God all the time. And it's not just when you pray, it's that, in fact, it's a dialogue. You're talking to him, he's talking to you. And you're hearing things in, your, in yourself that you never would have thought of in a million years. And you get used to the idea that there's a voice talking to me. And I'm not crazy. Well, well I'm not sure about that because sometimes what you hear, like when you start reading the Bible, it used to be just a, a muddle of verses that you couldn't make any sense out of. And you'll be reading along, and you'll have these thoughts that are so far out there. Not any way you would have thought of it, these things. But, and you, you, that's when you say to yourself, I must be crazy. And then you come to a meeting like this, and you hear the craziest one of all <laughs> tell you, it's all of that and a lot more. And you say, Then you say, ah, that is lekka. That is better. Lekka, lekka. That's, that's better. <laughs> that's better. Now I'm not so alone. So you begin to enter into the life, the corporate life of the body of Christ. And you begin to grow up. You begin to grow up. Now along the way, you have all kinds of challenges. So, for example, when you were a young believer, uh, and you were late for an appointment, you know, you'd be asking God, oh God, I need a parking space just outside of the office. I have this appointment. I need, you know, I need for you to help me. And surely you would be around the corner and right in front of the door, somebody's just pulling out. And you say, thank you, Jesus. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, how I love Jesus. <laughs> and you run right in, and for a while it seems that everything you ask God for is right there on the money. A year or two goes by, go by, and you're still running late. Praying, oh God, yes, please, like you have always done, give me the parking space. And you pull up, and there's, it's even the handicap spots are filled. 
and you drive around the block and by now you're five minutes late. And you park down the block and you walk up. And you do the interview and things do not go well. That was just the worst. The worst part had not begun. So you get back in your car and you say, God, I don't understand this. There was a time when I could just think it and you'd give it to me. So what is going on? I guess I just don't hear God anymore. Man says, no. God is trying to tell you to get up earlier. Because you're not a child anymore. You're being introduced to the growing up into him. Because maturity is the required end of this. Because God did not become your father just to give you things. God became your father so that in maturing you, he can be glorified in you. And what that means is, when the world sees you, you who are spirit, from his spirit, clothed in flesh, when they see you in the mature way, they will see his patience in you. They will see his kindness in you. This, they will see his perseverance in you. They will see you as one willing to forgive, but at the same time confront what is evil. They will see you always having hope, always persevering, and the most dependable person that anyone has ever met. That's 1 Corinthians 13. It's a description of love. The love of God put on display in you and through you. And you know what they say of you? They started out thinking that you were weird and different from them and not worthy to run with them. But while you were separated from them, going through all this discipline and training, where your mindset is renewed, where you have to get up earlier, where you have to... All these things where you have to learn to be patient. You have to learn to obey in the midst of adversity. And he does all this to you. Beats you on the anvil with a hammer. Puts you in the water. And you shrink up. And, and you, you freak out. And he puts you back in the fire. <laughs> and then he brings you back out. And he pounds on you again. And uh, about the time you think you figured it out, he puts you back in the water. And about the time you cool off, he puts you back into the fire. And he beats you. Aye. <laughs> That's when you say, this is not lacquer. <laughs> but one day, you meet the old friends. And now, their course continued. And they have become what they sought after. And all the disappointments of life hang on them like clothing that has been reduced to rags. And they meet a prince of the order of God who's royal He's, he's of a, a title called the Order of Melchizedek. A royal priest. And they, look, they do a double take and they say, I don't even recognize you. I do not even recognize you. I would have passed right by you. Let me tell you about my life. Maybe you can help me. They want you 
the priest of God. You, the one with the wisdom, adorned with wisdom and majesty, to, de to dissect, help dissect their lives and help them come up with solutions. Because in their streets, in their neighborhood, walks a person of a different origin. A fully mature spiritual son is clothed in the righteousness of his father. I also want to tell you this. I do not know such a son who is poor, who is ignorant, I do not know such a son who is without wisdom, who is without understanding. You see, righteousness does indeed exalt people. If all we want to get in life are possessions, possessions in life do not make us anything different it just means we have those possessions. But when you're clothed with the righteousness of God, when you have the spirit of understanding, and counsel, power, God does not let you continue even in your material circumstances. He gives you the economy that is necessary for his representation. He does. That's why he said you should seek first. And the words are true. And all these things shall be added unto you. Because to have these things is not an end within itself. People seek what they, people say they're seeking the kingdom. And they'll cite the scripture that says, seek ye first the kingdom. But the emphasis always comes to be, and all these things. When you hear that, you hear the sound of a fool. I don't care if he's standing in a pulpit or not. He's a fool. Because he values the things more than he values the purpose for the things. If you have things without purpose, the things will determine your purpose. If you have things without purpose, the things will determine your purpose. God help you if, you, if you're living in the world directed by the ownership of what you possess. If your life is directed by the things you possess, then yours is a truly vacuous, wasted life. But if you have the life of the kingdom, if you are constituted and functionally, constituted as and functionally becoming a ruler, in the kingdom of heaven. Ruler meaning in your circumstances, it has pleased the Lord to raise you up as the standard of excellence, the standard of his presence in your environment. I promise you, on the authority of scripture, your material circumstances cannot remain the same. Amen. Cannot. Because when you're found faithful with a small endowment, then God will give you greater authority. God will give you greater honor. God will give you greater place. Because God wishes to be seen as he is. And there are not many people who are available to God by whom and through whom he can demonstrate the excellence of his nature. There are not many people. 
compared to the, the, the billions alive, there are not many people who are useful to God in this way. So, when you become that mature son, and he disciplines you, he trains you, he matures, when you become that son of maturity, he will alter your circumstances to reflect his will in your life, through your life. And the living God will never embarrass you. If he calls you to speak before kings, he will give you the accoutrement that go with speaking with kings. And that's when you should have the accoutrements that go with speaking with kings. Because he does not have his princes show up as beggars before the courts of the earth's kings. I've had occasion, I've had occasion in my life to speak to noble people. And when they respond by asking, what can I do for you? My response has always been, thank you for your kindness and your generosity, but may I assure you, I'm very well supplied. I never accept, I never accept the gen generosity of others who see me, um, to whom I've been sent to declare the word of the Lord. One man one time wanted to give me an entire retreat because it was the best thing he felt like he could do for me. And I said to him, oh no, you keep it. And when I have a need for it, then I'll, I'll requisition it. See, the Lord did not go into the business of raising donkeys so he could have one when he needed to ride. You keep it. You keep it. Let it work for you. And when, I ha when the Lord hath need of it, then he'll requisition it. Never be, never be for sale. And indeed, a mature son of God has the estate of his father. What does he lack? You see, God does not have to create a storehouse and stock it with everything that I may need. He can create what I need any time I need it. Anytime I need it, when I need first class airline tickets, he can create them. So he doesn't stock them up. He doesn't have a whole warehouse full of automobiles in the event that I will need them. When I need one, he arranges the circumstances. But that's the confidence of a, of a son who knows his father. See, the whole creation was established to show the love of God, to support the showing of the love of God. The original story is that God, who is a spirit who loves, was compelled to show his existence because love, like faith and hope, are relational concepts. They cannot even be said to exist apart from a relationship. So God, who in when he began, when God began to reveal his nature to us at the beginning of creation, we see the deep, we see the waters. And we see the Spirit. At the beginning of this creation, 
That is how God appeared to us. The Father is the deep. The Word is the Son. And the Spirit works in tandem with the Word to bring about the will that is in the deep into what is created. So God created out of the deep. God said, I will disclose myself. I will be known. See, at that point, neither heaven nor earth existed. So you can't say the deep was the deep ocean or deep space. Because before creation, the Bible says, now the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. That's before there was a created earth. That's before God created. So it's not like God sitting on the throne of heaven speaking over the deep waters of the Atlantic Ocean, the Mariana Trough. It's not that. There was none of that yet. Nor the heavens, nor were the heavens. So the deep is with reference to that which existed before creation came. The deep calls to the deep. Spirit calls to spirit. God is the deep. The deep of being. Uh, the unfathomable. Uh, there is even a scripture that says, oh, the height and the depth, the unfathomable nature of God. This is the deep. And out of the deep, for us to see were the waters. The waters are the word. And hovering over the waters, the waters are the word because they contain the mind of God. The mind of God is in the word. The mind of God can be revealed out of the word. And it's the spirit who hovers over the mind of God to bring out of the mind of God and to execute where we can where it can become creation to execute what is in the deep so when God said at the beginning of creation uh, let there be light he was saying so because darkness was on the face of the deep which which means that the, that God as he was was obscured for long ages past. So now when he said, let there be light, he was saying, now in this creation, I will be disclosed. I will show myself. How does he show himself? In creation, he shows himself as father. And in creation, he shows himself as son. He established the order of himself as son with the intention of having endowed earth with spirit and calling him son. That son that he's creating in that fashion would be assembled to that portion of God, that expression of God that he chose to call son. And named it Christ. Named that, not it, but name that expression of God, Christ. You assembled to that expression of God, known as Christ, like members of a body. So that Christ has a body. You are members of the body. That body is spirit. In the aggregate, that entire body, is known as Son. So, in the creation of the world, God elected to be known to His Son, and God elected to be known through His Son. For the Son was created, we were created to be sons of God, to be assembled into the uncreated God who is also known as Son. 
so that the radiance of the Father's glory might be put on display through Son and the exact representation of the invisible God might be shown visibly through Son. God will gather everything in heaven and on earth in Son. And when that gathering is complete, God himself, God himself, will put himself on display in the entirety of his choice to be displayed in and through the Son. That's what this was about. So, it's time in the earth, I'm closing it up now, it is the time in the earth for the people to understand what the original intention of God was. God wanted to be known in and through the Son. And to that end, we're being brought to maturity. It, is, it will no longer do for us to be children. Only if we are newborns in Christ should we continue to be children. But from now on, let us set our collective minds on becoming mature. Everything exists in heaven and on earth to assist us to become mature. The purpose for being born again is not to go to heaven when you die, although you will. And, and you'll keep on, we'll keep on going until until the Lord, until the matter is finished and the Lord returns from heaven. However, the purpose of God in the earth for us is to bring us to maturity so that we collectively, in Christ, as the Son of God, might put on display in the earth the glory of our Father. It was with this in mind that the Apostle John, who had been to heaven, who had seen, he had looked into the circles of heaven, he had seen the end of the matter from the beginning. He then, he would then say, or he would say, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we might be called the sons of God. Sons of God. Brethren, we are not of this world. We're born from above. We are the holy seed. We've been raised to life to be assembled into the corporate man, to be crowned with glory and honor, to have the age to come be subject to the sons of God. Behold what manner of love. We of all people know the love of God. That we should call him Father is to acknowledge the unfathomable love of God. Not just pity, but the absolute delight that, that the deep finds in the created ones whom he endowed with being to this end. He called us sons and now in Christ we may call him Father, Father. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace that is able to build you up and to establish you among the sanctified. May grace, mercy, and peace be with you always. Amen.
when Sam speaks maturity, you realize fast, it's not without reference to your past. So worldly wisdom will not suffice. The Apostle Paul knew we had nothing else but to preach only Christ as our foundation in life. 1 Corinthians 2, Sam, quote, milk versus solid food. Take note, if you can't digest the T-bone steak, you know carnality has overtake your mind. Occupied with what shall I eat and what shall I drink? And envy and strive still rule your life. Feed a baby solid food and you'll be accused. Because a charge will be laid called child abuse. <laughs> Maturity, the divine standard. Nothing to do with man's efforts. All in the design of God. To speak wisdom that will bring to naught pride and prejudice in the kingdom of God. For our glory and the glory of God, glory we had before we were born, as written in the 17th chapter of John. The glory you gave me I have given to them. Now deep calls to deep even the deep things of God. Not teaching you anything new, Sam says, but a revelation that brings to life and cuts through us like a sharpened knife. Sam, as one of the architects of God, held out the word of truth for Christ, his Lord. Stuff was shared we have not known before, but this is God opening a door to treasures hidden, but now no more. It amazes us to the core. As if this was not all, he threw in a ball that took a curve. And before we knew, our heads were spinning. Is this not something short of sinning? <laughs> Heaven is not eternal, huh? Very soberly, he reiterates, nothing that has a beginning and end can ever be eternal. We concentrate, now we wait, as truth reverberates. We thought we were on our way to heaven to walk on the streets made of pure gold, and now our view of heaven lay shattered and scattered. Thank God for that, because now we have revelation beyond that which we had. Destiny now preordained, conformed to the likeness of Christ, sonship we obtained. Ephesians 1, 1 through to 5, God has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and without blemish before him in love, having predestined us for adoption as of sons through Jesus Christ to himself. When God put the Son in the world, a body was prepared for him, out of heaven into the earth to be the exact representation of God. No man can enter to the Father but by Christ. The only accurate description of God, Sam taught us. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then we were taken to Genesis 1, we were taught about the creation and a hush fell on the congregation. Earth was a wasteland without form and void, but then God stepped in and gave it a form. From uselessness to usefulness, Adama ground the earth. So out of Adama, God sculpted and squeezed Adam was formed, but no life did he breathe until God breathed himself into this form, presenting to earth the highest being greater than heaven and earth. With the capacity to contain the wisdom of heaven and earth, manifestations of God's being, God is not visible, but now he is visible through man. That man 
he called son and crowned him with glory and honor. We too are destined to rule this age to come. And before we knew it, we were hit with another revelation. Darkness was on the face of the deep. Sam asked, if the veil is a veil of darkness, how do you remove it? Well, the sun, the moon, not the sun, the moon, and the stars, but God illuminating himself, removing the veil of hovering darkness. Then we learned the price of redemption fell on the firstborn. If not redeemed, it fell on the Lord. Sam used the example of Samuel. Samuel now belonged to the Lord. Elkanah had not redeemed his firstborn. So the purpose of creation, Sam taught, was to help us see the invisible God. The deep we are taught are the thoughts of God. Deep calls to deep. God calls to God. His intentions disclosed. Now we have access to the mind of God. The spirit knows the mind of God. Now we know we too have that power to know the mind of God. It's the spirit who breathes life on God's word. Don't weep, the angel said to John. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed. In the midst stood a lamb, and it looked as if he was slain. The lion overcomes, the lamb, the sacrifice, the fullness of the Godhead bodily dwells in Christ. The excitement mounts in our hearts and minds as we learn that the lion is the pre-existing Christ. In the person of the lion is the lamb. God will speak to his people by the Spirit. The glory of the pre-existent Christ and the glory of the obedient Christ, that the throne of God is in Christ. Two realms governed by the throne of God, the realm of heaven and the realm of earth. And this brings us to the corporate man, the last piece of the earth to be formed was man. In that vessel, that container, that man, God placed the realm of heaven and earth, now capable of engaging the heavens and actions and the activities in the earth. If the soul is subject to the spirit, man becomes the son of God on earth, the divine presence on earth through corporate man. Jesus was focused, obedient and sure. When Jesus healed on the Sabbath, his heart was pure. He was accused of breaking traditional lines. Jesus knew it was not his father's confines. Tradition that represent a person, tradition that annuls the word. God is not the father of anyone. And to claim God as his father, Jesus knew that was an offense that justified death. For in claiming this, Jesus made himself equal to God. Blasphemy to a mind without the Lord. Letting them know he knew his father's thoughts and by his obedience bring traditions to naught. Now this requires a certain mindset, a mind that's intentionally disciplined at that to present your body a living sacrifice that puts the old man to death and a new man to rise. 
putting your body out there to the disposal of the Father. And that is why we don't have to fear death because Christ is the resurrection and the life. A trust in God that is all encompassing the whole person for his habitation. The four living creatures, the corporate man, first the lion and then the ox, third the face of him like a man and fourth the flying eagle. This corporate man has access to both spheres, both the visible and invisible, now surpasses audaciously the unthinkable. This morning we learned the body of Christ is a spiritual man. We are clothed with the perishable so that those who are perishing may see eternal hope. Then Sam talked about the alternative gospel of conciliation. The gospel of conciliation appeals to the flesh. We were reminded of what we used to believe, used to since this morning, of our dream to walk those streets of gold over the hilltop where we never grow old. So I fly away to my mansion on the hilltop. And there it disappears in the light of revelation. We're going to our Father's house, Christ. Christ is the dwelling place of many sons, the Father's children. So let not your heart be troubled. The Spirit of God assembles you in the body of Christ. You were designed to fit into the body of Christ. I will not leave you as orphans. Orphans are not assembled in any house. You are not an orphan anymore. You are a son reconciled.